Hey, Cypher here. As expected, the comments on my Soviet Myths episode have become unmanageable. For the last few weeks, about a quarter were bigoted, and therefore resulted in a ban, because bigots get banned. It's okay to be hateful of hatred, ignorant of ignorance, and deny denialists. Turnabout is fair play. Another quarter got deleted for perpetuating falsehoods, either about the video itself or history. You can't criticize in good faith if you lie or commit bigotry to do it. As Star 3 Catcher succinctly replied to one of my tweets, you are entitled to your own opinions, not your own facts. That leaves about half the comments that are worthy of historical discussion, some of which I will be talking about here. And as I said in the video, If they get too nasty, I'll disable them. No spreading hate in my comments section. Since I haven't seen anything new in the comments section after the first week of its release, and it's become a drag on the channel, it's time to close it. I do try to save comments I delete with screen caps, unless they're just so overwhelmingly commonplace that I need no further examples. Unfortunately, I can't save entire comment sections anymore, since the tool for it is no longer available. So I might leave it open for a little while longer to collect a few more examples. If any of you know a tool for that, or for converting a bunch of PNGs to text so I can more easily filter through these screen caps, I'd love to find some good solutions. Anyways, I figured I'd make a video about some of the misconceptions I've seen in the comments. In the past, I've left the comments on for response videos as a place for legitimate conversation to continue, since most of the bad commenters are too lazy and stupid to continue to the next video. Though that's not to say they won't come, but it makes moderation far easier. So we'll go point by point with some of the most common ones. Before that, I will say that I made one glaring mistake. Greensboro is in North Carolina, not South Carolina. Also, I mispronounced a few names. That's gonna happen. After all, which would you rather have me do? Dig into the sources by reading them, or listen to hearsay from people yapping about it online? I obviously choose proper research, which means reading. So mispronunciation is bound to occur when you're doing so much reading. And for those angry about mispronunciation, too bad so sad. Your indignation is precisely why I don't care about getting that correct anymore. Mispronunciation will happen. Okay, so that's out of the way. First, just the general level of animosity in the comments was fully expected, but I need to at least tell you guys about how nasty it gets. I only received two death threats and about ten regular threats, which, as a historian on this website, is all too common. Luckily, no credible threats this time. That's part of why I keep my pseudonym on this channel, though there are many other reasons. People are infatuated with their myths, and so the only recourse they have is impotent rage. It's kind of sad, but they're bigots, so they get banned. Also, a few of these folks claim I'm arguing for the myths I'm arguing against. This is pretty dumb, but inevitable with reactionaries. Finally, how has no one examined my citations and references? Seriously, no critical, angry, or bigoted comment has done so. The only ones who have mentioned my sources, or asked me about them in a comment, are those in agreement. Anyone who wants to competently argue with a historian needs to do that. Of course, there's several who claim I'm not a historian, but once again, denying my decade in the academy is bigotry and will get you banned. Of course, what actually makes a historian is if they've published new scholarship on a subject. And in fact, I did so with the Allied intervention in the Russian Civil War six years ago. So this is somewhat of an old specialty of mine, though I'm no longer working on the subject. Also, I've got the typical, this is biased crowd. I take pride when I manage to get both red baiters and tankies complaining of my bias. Shows I'm doing something right. I ambiguate my political ideology on purpose. These complaints are more revealing of their bias rather than mine. But in either case, bias doesn't change the truth. Complaints of political bias belie a deep misunderstanding of the world. They function as a form of denialism, and are therefore unworthy of historical discussion. Next, we've got a bunch of folks saying I'm an apologist for Marx or the Soviets. One, I ain't a Marxist, and if they bothered to stick around, they'd realize how foolish a statement that is. I spend a good chunk of the video talking about the horrors of the Soviet regime. 
And though the video is about Soviet myths, Marx himself had many foibles, including rampant anti-Semitism and xenophobia, severe neglect of his children, belligerence with other socialists to the point of claiming sole provenance over the movement, and general hypocrisy in how he treated his supposed friend, Friedrich Engels. I have never apologized for such behavior, but this is a case where their comments reveal their unwillingness to think historically, and instead are red baiters, which means someone who harasses or persecutes on account of known or suspected communist sympathies. I'm not here to pass judgment on history, unless the figure's name is Woodrow Wilson, then I get to be as judgmental as I want. But to these people, apologism apparently is telling the truth. Historical denialism is strong with red baiters. Then there's ones trying to say Marx is responsible for Bolshevism because they bore his name, or that it's Marxism, not Marx himself. In either case, these people ignore the fact that Bolshevism is just one offshoot of many. I even name several in the episode itself. Just because it is derived from Marxism does not mean Marx is responsible for it. And this isn't even talking about the differences between Leninism, Maoism, Ho Chi Minh thought, the Frankfurt School, anything following Antonio Gramsci, or whatever. It's intellectually dishonest to not be able to differentiate between these things. Marxism is not a monolith, and to say otherwise is to display open ignorance, just as that PragerU video I show does. That's actually from their supposed biography of Marx, and they still spout out that tired old black book of communism nonsense, because it's PragerU, a YouTube channel designed to specifically support grifters and nothing more. This school will have failed if any of you graduate. Imagine for a moment a world in which there was no murder or theft. This would drive me mad. Here is a fact. Dennis Prager should frighten you. The standard communism has killed a hundred million people shtick comes from the black book, which many of its contributors have thoroughly denounced. Tristan from Step Back History did an excellent episode on the topic. Of course, with that supposed body count of a hundred million, a bunch are complaining that capitalism hasn't killed as much. Now, what I said was this. For the far more people who've died because of capitalist countries. That's pretty undeniable. They had more than a century of a head start on communism. Now, I carefully worded that so they couldn't argue over whether capitalism was the culprit, effectively making anyone saying otherwise genocide deniers. But by the same logic that deaths caused by communist countries count towards communism's death toll, then I guess the same should be said for capitalism. Putting deaths caused by capitalist countries at 100 million is not just an underestimate, it's outright denial. Then again, by even stronger logic, Jesus Christ is responsible for even more than Marx, given the sheer amount of death dealt in his name. Atrocity denial is the worst form of bigotry and makes for a very easy ban. Moving on to Myth 2, we first have a few people who think Myth 1 and 2 contradict each other. To be perfectly honest, I designed much of this to catch those with an inability to comprehend nuance right off the bat. These are not contradictory. In fact, they reinforce each other. What that means is if Marx is not to blame for Bolshevism, and that Bolshevism is a genuine attempt at communism, then there are other ways of interpreting Marx or other leftist thinkers. These commenters can only think in absolutes, incapable of any level of nuance, which means they can never have a respectable opinion on history. Of course, with that myth, there's a lot of people trying to move the goalposts. A few have said correctly that the Soviet experiment is better said to have not achieved communism, rather than having not tried. That's correct. But once again, quite a few people said that they didn't even try, which is moving the goalposts. Just because they only got to the in-between stage of socialism doesn't change what they tried. These folks rely on saying Marx's definition doesn't fit the Soviet regime, which is true, but does not change that they tried. Sensing a pattern here? Marx does not control the English language. Marxists might have their own special vocabulary, but I don't speak some arcane language dreamt up by Marx. I speak English. He did not invent communism nor socialism, both of which predate him by quite a bit. Heck, socialist philosophers predate capitalist philosophers. Yeah, in a sense, socialism predates capitalism. 
even if Marx somehow invented communism and socialism himself, he still wouldn't have absolute control over their definition. But this is a result of perhaps Marxists' second favorite pastime. What do they complain about the most? Capitalism! Capitalism, of course. What do they complain about half as much? This, not that I believe in any communist revolution or whatever. Other Marxists. With these people, there's only one interpretation and everything else simply insufficiently understands Marx. I even had a guy claim I've never read Marx. That's some pretty funny denialism right there. About this version of Das Kapital is that it's abridged by Trotsky, which means that it's a double helping of those evil commies. <laughs> it's a common parlor trick of Marxists to redefine something so that it doesn't apply to reality, which we will see again in this response video. Moving on to myth number three, this hasn't inspired much contention. Mostly, it is people arguing about the definition of what the Cold War is, which is precisely what the myth is about. They aren't wrong to argue it, for it is that argument that proves the myth wrong. No definition will work since it is contradicted by the pre-existence of whatever tensions that entails. The closest one I've seen is that the Cold War is nuclear powers staring each other down or something along those lines, but that's negating the first four years of what everyone acknowledges as the Cold War, since it took a while for the Soviets to develop their bomb. So nothing will work, and tensions clearly pre-exist World War II. It's that old periodization problem again. So. Number four has some tankies claiming that Lenin was right to purge people because he faced a counter-revolution. Now, I'm not here to pass judgment, and for the record, I wrote and researched that section. Cody simply voiced it and injected a little personality. Anyways, you can argue the justice of Lenin's mass murdering if you want, ugh, but you'll inevitably contradict yourself. Numerous of his purges were not crushing what even he deemed counter-revolutions. Some were purely vindictive. Also, many commenters attempt to excuse his dissolution of the Constituent Assembly by saying it was supposedly working with white Russians or counter-revolutionary itself. In reality, that purge was purely an anti-democratic power grab. It's what started the Russian Civil War, so it's quite the opposite of the Assembly working with white Russians because this is what created that rebellion. Those saying this are essentially conspiracy theorists. The purpose of a constituent assembly is to create a constitution. It was elected to perform this duty, and Lenin was clearly dissatisfied that Bolsheviks were in the minority, because Lenin formed another assembly instead, composed entirely of his own appointments. That's not fighting a counter-revolution, that's him countering a revolution, just like what Stalin would do a decade later. But that's not the worst of the tankies. That comes at number five. As predicted, they get all up in the huff about the Holodomor. And once again, while we can argue about Stalin's culpability, he clearly worsened the Soviet famine in Ukraine to the tune of at least three million unnecessary deaths. That much is beyond doubt. But these are tankies, and they exist by denying atrocities. Number six, we get back to some proper debate. A lot of commenters have brought up America's Lend-Lease program. From 1941 to 45, the U.S. sent war material to the USSR. Over $11 billion worth, which is around $160 billion today, making about 8% of the total Soviet war effort. Of course, what this forgets is that 84% of that aid came after the Soviets turned the Nazi tide. Yep, the argument that I made in the video still applies to Lend-Lease. With far more loss of life, industry, and infrastructure for the Soviets, they turned the tide of Nazi power first. Even with that said, it's important to note that Lend-Lease did not have as significant an effect as so many commenters seem to believe. After all, 8% is a pretty small amount. So while Lend-Lease was certainly an important part of their war effort, it does not constitute saving. Nor does it discount the fact that the USSR lost many more lives fighting that war than any other country. But not the highest in total death count. The Soviet Union again tops that list, losing at least as many civilians as it did soldiers. So it is false to say Lend-Lease saved the USSR, but I probably could have at least gone over that in the video's argument. Moving on to number seven, we're back to tanky arguments. They say Marx or the Soviets had their own definition of imperialism that doesn't apply to the USSR. Basically, they're saying only capitalists can be imperialists. See what I mean by denying reality? This is where it would behoove them to examine my sourcing, 
because there's an entire chapter in that Burbank and Cooper book which is devoted to this specific myth. Of course, that requires tankies to read history, and that's unlikely. So moving on to myth number eight, the only thing I remember people saying about this one was that it could use some expansion. For instance, I paint Andropov as too short-lived to be any different than Brezhnev. Brezhnev. Andropov and Chernenko were short-lived and essentially the same as Brezhnev. Brezhnev. So it's Brezhnev? I wasn't that far off. So what are all the complaints about? Anyways, Andropov did implement some unique policies, and he was especially paranoid about American espionage. But you get the point. The various gen sects were even more unique than what I could say without adding another five minutes to the video. Fair enough. So moving on to Myth 9. Here we see a return of the red baiting comments. They say the mere existence of Soviet subterfuge programs and funneling any amount of money to American civil rights organizations proves the myth. This is a part of the rising tide of fear-mongering in the U.S. about things like Black Lives Matter. In order to deny the legitimacy of such civil rights groups, they call it subversion. As part of that denial, they'll lie about McCarthyism and spout conspiracy theories. No, the Senate censured McCarthy because he lied about communist subversion. Many of these people take umbrage with the fact that the term cultural Marxism is an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. I hear you're a racist now! That's all, folks. They assert it's a real thing, once again claiming the Frankfurt School is somehow trying to destroy culture and implement communism. First of all, it's not called cultural Marxism. It's pretty difficult to claim you know about some secret group of academics working to subvert culture through identity politics. If you can't even name the group. By the way, this so-called identity politics thing is not Marxist in the least. You just don't understand! You just don't understand that Western civilization is rapidly being destroyed by this postmodern neo-Marxist postmodern cultural types! That'll be $2,000. Pure ideology! So, you claim postmodernism is repented Marxism? Yes! So you claim this despite the fact that Marxism is a materialist philosophy which postmodernism rejects? Uh, you know, the, the lobster... In fact, it's kind of built from a basic rejection of Marxist analysis, called materialism. So to Marx, history consists of a series of class conflicts. Each time, a group has power over another group's labor. As Marx says, to accumulate is to conquer the world of social wealth. So the subordinate group produces commodities for the upper class until the exploitation becomes too much. That's why early neoconservatives came from Trotskyism. Anytime you've heard them say, it's class, not race, that's actually neoconservatives showing their Marxist basis. So while the new left has some basis in the Frankfurt School, neocons have some Marxism built into their theoretical basis as well. So Reagan was a secret Soviet spy, mwahaha! <laughs> If you don't get that joke, you really shouldn't be claiming knowledge about this stuff. The specific set of analytical tools these people think they're referring to is called critical theory. The Frankfurt School is just one component of numerous ways of analyzing media proposed by these theorists. It's influential, but not some secret plot to subvert our culture. For all these folks complaining about silencing criticism through censorship, it's rather hilarious how afraid they are of actual criticism. It's exactly what I said in the video. It's meant to silence people through underhanded threats of violence. On to Myth 10, where we have a few people trying to say Reagan won the Cold War because he sent aid to Afghanistan and ramped up US military spending. Well, Carter actually began supporting Mujahideen before Reagan even entered office. And just as we've discovered time and again, guerrillas don't need major military support to win. They just need to wear down their enemy long enough for them to pull out. This wasn't the American War of Independence. The Mujahideen's fight depended mostly on their resilience, not Stinger missiles. Though that's not to say that they didn't depend on foreign war material in numerous ways. But hopefully you get the point. If this claim were true, then we'd expect to see the Soviets trying to outspend the US military, but guess what? Soviet military spending drastically decreased throughout the 1980s. Oops. On to the bonus myth. The only complaints I've seen is people saying Judaism is not only a religion but a race, which is actually addressed in the video. And let's just think about what these commenters are defending. 
They're trying to say a specific race controlled the Bolsheviks. This is just that standard anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. I need not go into the ethnicity of each Bolshevik. Most were Slavs, not Jews. Heck, the most prominent Jewish Bolshevik, Trotsky, started as a Menshevik and was exiled in the 1920s. No, these people are trying to defend a conspiracy theory, a racist one at that. But what do you expect from bigots? So once again, time to close that comments section. Not everything I've responded to here was in bad faith, but nothing new is being said. And about half the comments are either lies, misconceptions, or bigotry. All of which is wholly unworthy of historical discussion other than for exclusion and ridicule. Remember, bigots get banned, lies get deleted, and unruly comment sections get disabled. And for all those knights in shining armor out there, ready to defend the so-called rights of commenters, free speech does not guarantee you a right to my platform. For people who claim to stand for free speech, you are sure willing to obliterate mine in order to get it. This is a channel devoted to history, and if you have trouble with that, as in you resort to lying and bigotry in order to try to make your statement, then you can go somewhere else. I'd rather remove all interactions on my channel than suffer bigotry to spread. The audio for this one was recorded over a month ago, and the comments kept piling in, but I decided not to add all of those because, well, it's not worth bothering. Hopefully you guys got something out of this and know how to spot a little bit more of the bad arguments that proliferate all over the internet.